this meeting is being audio recorded uh, with the permission of the speaker for the purpose of sharing the message to sex and love addicts. Uh, so we will begin with Shane speaking, which will then be followed by questions at the end. Please use the chat function to send messages to me privately and then we'll ask the question to the speaker. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Shane who will be sharing experience, strength and hope uh, with a focus on the HOW program. So Shane, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thanks Liz. Hi, my name's Shane. I'm a sex and love addict. Um, I'm just going to start by saying my computer's seconds or so. I'm just hoping you guys can't uh, hear it at your end. I look uh, distracted. That's why. Um, well, I'm, I'm speaking from Sydney, so I'd like to make a special acknowledgement of um, what everyone in Melbourne is going through in the lockdown. I've been reading a lot of articles about how to cope and so on, and I can only imagine that in your feeds and news bulletins and so on in Melbourne, you're seeing far more of those sorts of um, support devices than I am. But interestingly, one that caught my eye during the week, I think ties in very nicely with the concepts behind the HOW program, and that was saying that to cope with the pressures of lockdown, what um, people need is routine and structure to help um, maintain their mental health. And routine and structure is, I guess, what the HOW program is about. One of the common phrases is that it's a disciplined and structured approach for working the 12 steps and 12 traditions. And just to give you a little bit of history, um, I wasn't around when the HOW program started. It came in about 1997 in Sydney. There were three people um, who helped introduce it to SLA. They were really frustrated. They were attending meetings where there wasn't any sobriety. Um, there was a lot of um, intrigue going on at meetings, a lot of sex logs happening, and women in particular didn't feel very safe at the meetings. And there was frustration uh, that people weren't getting sober. And I think, to be honest, SLA and Sydney didn't have a very good reputation amongst the other fellowships. So, um, at least two of these three people were in um, another fellowship, uh, which did have the, the um, HAL program already. And two of them plus a third person sat down and converted the questions from Overeaters Anonymous, which were originally developed in California, one of the meetings there, adapted them to sex and love addiction. And um, a key, I won't go into the HAL program too much now, the mechanics, I'm gonna come back to it once I've gone through my story, but one of the key features of the HAL program is that the focus is on uh, sobriety. You need to have sobriety to share in meetings. And there's an effort to have the uh, shares and meetings be positively focused on experience, strength and hope. Um, and that seemed to work. People started to get sober in Sydney. And one of the, um, one of the three people that helped adapt the program to SLA moved to the UK. And she started off by sponsoring one person. And if you look at the UK website today, you'll see that the majority of meetings, and they have dozens of meetings over there, are how meetings. So um, how works, I guess, which is why people follow it, but it is only one way of working the steps. And it's simply a method of working the steps. There's nothing different about what you do. Um, it just has a particular structure to it. Um, so I came into how, um, in, well, I came to SLA, I should say, in 2012. And I'll come back to why. But interestingly, when I thought about it, I gravitated to HOW meetings. I went to a number of different ones, and the meetings that appealed to me turned out to be HOW meetings because they had more people with long term sobriety, people who could speak with a lot of insight about their own uh, disease, and who seemed to have an idea of what the solution looked like. And when I went to non-HOW meetings, looking back, um, there wasn't anything wrong with them, but they were filled with people like me who didn't really seem to know what they were doing. And I liked the, um, the longer term sobriety that the HOW meetings had uh, that I was going to. So I just kind of gravitated to HOW without realizing um, that's what I was doing. But if I just go back to my beginning, I grew up in a family with um, an emotionally distant father and a very anxious, depressed mother who didn't cope very well. And my role that I seemed to take on for myself at a remarkably young age was to keep my mother on an even emotional keel so that I felt safe. And if uh, she was upset, I didn't feel safe. 
Um, and so I learned to suppress my feelings and focus on my mother's feelings. And when I first came to SLA, that really didn't seem like a big deal. Um, there were always people that had these stories of horrific childhoods, and I, a part of me used to wish on one, one level that I could say I'd been abused or something, so I understood why I was an addict. But I've come to understand that um, not receiving something you need as a young child can be just as traumatic as receiving something you didn't need. And so there's, there's trauma there, and I grew up feeling um, invisible, feeling unseen, unheard, and as a consequence of that, unimportant. So um, my addiction really was about trying to find ways to pump myself up um, and feel better about myself. So um, what I would, what I tend to do and, and still do to some extent is default to um, better than in situations because I feel so um, bad about who I am as a person that I want to hide that from you by appearing better than you. And I love to be the expert in the room. I don't necessarily expect to be the smartest person, but I, I like to show how smart I am so that I feel safe. Because uh, I don't want you knowing um, how useless I really feel. And um, when, I, when I hit puberty, I had a lot of issues around masculinity. My father uh, grew up in Australia at the time in his compulsory military uh, service. And he was a boxer in the army because he discovered that got him out of a lot of uh, duties he didn't like to do. And when I had puberty, I realized I didn't have to build to be a boxer. And then my younger brother had puberty a few years later, and he um, turned out to have this good looking bad boy kind of thing going on that just really attracted women to him. And I felt even more invisible and unworthy as a person. And as I got a little bit older, sex seemed to be a way to affirm my masculinity and to really be seen. And I think because my issues with my heart, it's particularly women I want to feel seen by. But I notice I still have issues with men that I'm close to if I feel they don't understand my needs. I'm never going to tell them my needs, of course, because I spent most of my life being unaware of them. But um, I really want uh, people to recognize my needs because it never felt that happened as a, as a kid. And, and sex was a way I could feel validated. Um, so I, I went, I guess, through um, what seemed like a normal teenage years and 20s. Um, I couldn't get enough sex. Um, it didn't matter if I had a steady relationship. Um, I was always looking for more. Um, and things just over time gradually got worse and worse. By the time I was in late thirties, early forties, I'd become really socially isolated in a lot of ways. I was married, but um, I didn't make a lot of effort to see my friends. I didn't really participate in life. It was all about acting out. Um, and I've got a long laundry list of ways I learned to act out and either numb out or get hits. Um, and the, the, there's that line about the um, electric shock from a cattle prod that we needed to sort of jolt us into feeling like we're still alive. And that, that's very much like uh, I have become. Um, things really got out of control, I guess, but they did so slowly. And I didn't actually realize uh, how out of control they've got. I, um, I think that um, my addiction was affecting my work life. It was definitely affecting my, my marriage. My wife and I stayed together, but um, things became more and more distant between us. There really wasn't any connection happening there. And in terms of uh, what happened to bring me into SLA, um, not surprisingly, um, sooner or later, I got caught in a way that um, threatened my marriage. And my wife encouraged me to go to therapy, which um, I did for a period of time. Um, didn't really want to change, but I was prepared to make an effort, I suppose. And after a while in therapy, the therapist mentioned SLA to me. It hadn't occurred. I had actually said, I wish there was a 12-step program for this. And I wasn't in any 12-step programs, but I must have read an article about AA or NA or something. And, the therapist looked at me like I was crazy and said, of course, there's a program. There's several programs and SLA was the first one on the list he gave me. So um, beginning of 2012, I went to my first meeting 
And I've heard a lot of people say they felt uncomfortable, um, didn't feel like they belonged. I knew straight away that I belonged in SLA. I still felt uncomfortable because I was full of shame. I didn't want to um, talk to other people about how I actually felt. Um, I was very silent at first, and I'm very grateful for the older sober members who made an effort to talk to me at those first meetings and encouraged me to keep coming back. Um, because despite knowing that I'd found a solution, I wasn't sure if I was brave enough to actually embrace that solution. And as I said, um, I gravitated to how meetings um, and I started working the steps with a house sponsor. So um, I'll go over this in more detail, but essentially that means doing a week's worth of questions to help figure out what your bottom line should be. And then doing a series of uh, one question a day for a month, um, which takes you through steps one to three. Um, and the intensity of that, I guess, where you're doing uh, reading from the big book or the 12 and 12 or the slow handbook every day and writing on it and then discussing your answer with a sponsor. It's all a sudden um, feelings of insight into the disease and feeling like I'd really found a solution. So there's a bit of a high that comes from that, from feeling like here's something that can actually help me and, and feeling uh, this insight and, and starting to feel very slowly for me like I was part of a community. Uh, when I'd felt very isolated for a long time. But while I managed to get through that first month or um, five weeks pretty easily, um, it wasn't long into step four before I slipped. Um, I had to find a new sponsor at the end of step three because I'd caught up to the same level as my current sponsor. And I think my feelings of shame having to deal with a new sponsor were quite hard to deal with. Um, and I stopped doing things that were working in that first month. I had some slips and um, technically the HOW program says you do um, questions as assigned by your sponsor until, you're, um, until you've got a month's sobriety again. But the sponsor I had kept saying, don't worry, just keep going. Um, you need to do the steps. And so I got through to step 12 without being sober for, very, for longer than a week or two at a time. And this is not something I recommend to anyone. I learned that that doesn't work. I'd go to meetings and I could say all the right things. I'm smart enough to, to come up with the right answers to the questions I was working on. And I could look like I was working the program, but I really wasn't at that point. And somewhere between 12 and 18 months into recovery, um, things just really spiraled down uh, badly for me. I was acting out constantly. Um, I was slipping away from work to act out. I was looking for opportunities wherever I could. Um, and I really wasn't functioning at all well. Um, and what happened to actually get me um, some recovery was eventually I got to a second rock bottom and, and, and then something that led to what a friend of mine called a moment of insight. Um, I'd lost my job um, because I was so inefficient at work and I would, I'd go missing, as I said, to act out. Um, I couldn't stay in the office all day. Um, and, and this moment of insight that hit me was that my life was really falling apart and I was finally desperate enough to really work a program of recovery. And the amazing thing that happened is I just lost the desire to act out. It really was, I guess, a spiritual experience in the sense that the urge to, to act out in any way just vanished. And I didn't have any thoughts of acting out for nearly two years. I used to be in situations or places uh, which had memories of acting out. And what would occur to me was the thought that I used to act out here or this would have triggered me in the past. But it was always a past context kind of thought. It was never actually um, a current feeling that I might want to act out. So that was an absolute blessing. Um, but I guess when I'm talking about my sobriety there, I'm talking about the sobriety from sex addiction and the things that brought me into the fellowship initially. But um, what happened during that rock, rock bottom um, I was sure I was going to lose my marriage and I turned to one of the people I'd met doing service on intergroup who was a woman who'd been in the fellowship for 
nearly two decades, I think. And um, she was someone I really respected as having a lot of recovery. Um, she could talk really well about, she had a lot of insights into her own disease. And I said to her, I'm gonna lose my, ma my, my marriage. How can I save it? And her advice was to forget about my wife. She would do what she would do, but I had to try and save myself. And she um, did various things to help me um, from a recovery point of view. But the most interesting thing is that she asked me to go into business with her, which was completely crazy. I was in a terrible mess and I found out later she was as well. And we started working together, each of us thinking the other one was going to save us. So it was a perfect um, storm of uh, terrible things waiting to happen because neither of us were healthy people. And um, the great, I, I got so many gifts from that disastrous relationship. Um, it's interesting because this woman was someone who I respected from a recovery point of view and who I acknowledge was attractive, but I didn't think I was attracted to her. And she had so much sobriety, I never imagined there was any possibility for intrigue. But this disease is absolutely cunning, baffling and powerful. And I very quickly became love addicted to her. And the only thing that kept me sane was that she had introduced me to her business coach, who was a woman who had uh, over 20 years sobriety in AA. And she effectively became my sponsor at that time, um, because my own sponsor, after 27 years in AA, started drinking and, and frankly went a little bit mad um, at that point in time. And I, I stopped um, calling him because um, I couldn't get what seemed like sensible advice to me, although it may actually be that I was pretty crazy at the time and I just didn't want to hear what he had to say. But the business coach kept encouraging me to use step 11 in particular, lots of prayer, lots of conscious contact with my higher power, to get through the situation. And I was going into town early so I could have breakfast with this woman. I was spending all day with her. We didn't have a lot of work, work on, so we'd spend a lot of time walking around or sitting in a park or something and talking. And a lot of it was recovery talk, although we always tried to avoid talking about our own um, histories. But we got very emotionally close and I really depended on her for validation. Because I'd kind of put her on a pedestal in recovery terms, I really um, valued her positive opinion of me. And I didn't realize that she was trying to use me in a similar way because she knew I'd, I'd helped start a business which was sold to a multinational and she thought I could save her business. So um, we were a great, a great pair. Um, but I eventually realized that I had become love addicted to her and I had no bottom, bottom lines around this at all because um, that hadn't been a problem for me. And although I'd empathized with the stories I'd heard of love addiction, it didn't sound like me. And yet here I, I found myself in a love addicted relationship which had no romance and no sex and was quite mysterious and I worked really hard I start, uh, to, to deal with that. I started going to different meetings where people there didn't know um, the two of us because I found the fact that it's a small fellowship and in my regular meetings everyone knew the two of us. It was very difficult to outreach and get the sense that I was actually being heard because people would either say, oh, well, you know what she's like, blah, blah, blah. And I felt they weren't actually hearing the problem I had. They were putting it onto her and it was about how I was feeling. And so I, that really pissed me off. Or they try and fix me by giving me advice. And I learned um, the hard way. You can't tell someone what to do in recovery um, and expect them to do it, even if it is the right advice that you're giving them. You know, people have to be able to make their own mistakes and, and learn the lessons when they're ready to learn them. And when people told me to stop working with her, I wasn't prepared to hear that because I was so dependent on this woman emotionally, or at least I thought I was. And one of the other positive things that happened then was that she, I realized, pushed all the same buttons that my wife pushed. But I'd been with my wife for so long that I didn't really see the interactions between us clearly. They were just part of the landscape. And so when I'd get really annoyed with my business partner, I'd talk to my business coach about it and then realize that I did the same sort of interactions with my wife. And it actually gave me the ability to start working on changing them. I'd use steps 10 and 11 on a daily basis to try and um, work through uh, 
what I was learning from being triggered by my business partner. And the really remarkable thing is that I was able to pull myself by my bootstraps out of that love addiction while I was still working with her. And the magic moment for me came when we were on a phone call with someone else. We were sharing a, 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 a headset from the phone. So our heads were only two feet apart, probably we had one earpiece each. And her friend was talking about something um, where she needed a lot of luck. And my business partner said, I've got my fingers and toes crossed. I've crossed my legs as well, but my husband doesn't approve of me doing that. And I had the most intense, vivid sexual fantasy when I was awake that I've ever had. And it came and it went. And I realized with this blinding clarity, it was just a thought and it didn't have any power over me. It literally didn't matter that I thought of her sexually for the first time in our working relationship because it was just a thought and it was it was fleeting. I still remember it for the vividness of the thought, but it really meant nothing. And I realized she didn't have any hold over me anymore, but I also realized I had given her a power over me um, by the way I chose to think about a relationship. And I could take that power back just by choosing to think of myself in a healthier way. So I learned uh, so much from that relationship. Um, and I stopped working with her, started my own business um, with the intention of trying to rebuild my self-esteem uh, without relying on anyone else. And what happened is that um, I found clients who enjoyed working with me and who really valued what I did. And at the same time, I started to get people asking me to sponsor them. And they affirmed me in a healthy way. And I've never felt like I am a particularly good sponsor or could be a particularly good sponsor. Um, but people kept asking me to sponsor them and saying really nice things about me. And I had to start telling myself to believe the external evidence that I'm a better person than I give myself credit for. Um, so what, what it's like now um, as I walked away from that business relationship, I, I had four years of um, sobriety. I've had one slip and I'm nearly at two years again. And that one slip showed me, I really have to keep working this program every day. I'm a massive advocate of the fact that the 12 steps is a, a, a spiritual way of living. And we have to keep practicing that. It's not something we can do a walk away from 10, 11 and 12, which effectively works all the other steps are things that I have to keep practicing constantly to have any quality of life. And I do have a quality of life now that I never had before. Um, the relationship with my wife, who I'm still with from our, although we did separate for a couple of years, um, it's just so much better because I'm able to talk through things now. I, um, I have much deeper friendships that I've had for a long, long time because I've started to learn how to actually be vulnerable and open up. Um, I've done a lot of service in recent years and that has really helped me um, because there's no doubt in my active addiction, I was incredibly selfish and self-centered. It would never occur to me to think of what was going on to someone else. And um, now I still can revert to thinking from my point of view as the only one, but um, it's much more common now for me to realize that uh, other people will be thinking about uh, things in a different way to me. And it's funny, but one of my gifts of recovery uh, came through a pet. We inherited a parrot we got from our vet, which we were told was very traumatized. And it, they wanted it uh, to have a foster home for a while. And I somehow made this parrot the focus of my recovery my parents hadn't been able to help me with my trauma when I was young. And so I wanted to be able to help this bird simply because I've been told it was traumatized. And it's the, in some ways it's silly, but in other ways it's really profound because it was, it screamed and it bit and it was um, when it was in a bad mood and it wasn't pleasant to have around the house. And my wife said, we have to get rid of it. And so I started to have a chat to the parrot to explain that I wasn't able to help it. And Decades of built up um, emotions just came tumbling out and I started to cry for the first time in recovery. So this is six, six or so years into recovery and I had my first really good uh, cry where the tears were, tears were just streaming down my face. 
and I was sovereign, um, not really for the parrot, but for me and for the um, the opportunities I've missed in life, the, the um, pain that I've inflicted on myself. And we still have that, um, we still have that bird. And I now um, am so much more in touch with my feelings two years later. Although even so, still a lot of um, work to go. For me, uh, being in touch with my feelings hasn't been a fast uh, process, but uh, things have really started to change. Um, and having the structure of the program to fall back on when things turned really nasty has been incredibly helpful. So I'm going to tell you um, a bit more now about the HAL program and uh, more specifically how it works. And I'm going to start by telling you what it isn't. So the HAL program isn't something that's exclusive. Uh, non how members are welcome in every HAL meeting. Um, the only uh, thing that is asked is that they follow the sobriety guidelines um, that the HAL members will have as well, which is 14, 14 days for someone who hasn't finished the first three steps or seven days for someone who has. So they're not um, too difficult uh, to meet. Um, how isn't something different to working the steps. It's simply a process for working the steps a structure. And for those of you who have heard about the 30 questions, how is not really that much at all about the 30 questions. They're a small part of what's involved. Um, there's initial questions for setting bottom lines. The 30 questions that people talk about are the questions used to do the first three steps. And um, I think even the previous speaker said, if you don't get through the steps four and five, your chances of recovery are pretty, pretty poor. So how has questions to help you work step four? It has questions for step six to 12. And then it has two sets of questions, which are either 60 or 70 long board maintenance questions, which you can do if you want to keep doing structured step work once you finish the 12 steps. Um, and as I said, uh, I don't think you can lead a happy life, even if you're sober, if you're not using 10, 11 and 12 on a daily basis or at least, and I'm, I'm not perfect, there are certain days when I don't pray or meditate, um, I might not do step 10 every evening, but if I go for very long without actually using those three steps, um, my quality of life deteriorates pretty quickly. Um, another thing that how is isn't is group therapy or self-help. It is very much a spiritual program, and I think all slime meetings struggle a little bit from the idea that um, maybe 12 step is a little bit similar to group therapy and that we can talk about what's not going well in our lives um, and we feel better as a result. But uh, that's not really what meetings are about and certainly how meetings the focus is supposed to be on sharing experience, strength and hope. Uh, we get well by talking about what works, not by talking about the problem. Um, so the structure of how there's um, a number of tools that we specifically make use of. And most of these are tools, in fact, I'm sure all of these are tools that are used in recovery every day anyway. It's just that some of them have a specific role in the HOW program. So the first of these is bottom line sobriety. And the only real difference here is that you help to set your um, bottom lines by working with a sponsor. You do a set of questions and then you talk through what your bottom lines might be. Um, with your sponsor for the first, for doing those first three steps. So assuming you can stay sober for that month, it takes just the 30 days to do the first three steps and then you can review your bottom lines. There is a process though, um, I'm sort of jumping here, but everyone's encouraged to start sponsoring when they finish step three. And to be a sponsor, you need 30 days of sobriety under the HOW program. So if you have a slip, and break a bottom line during those first uh, 30 questions. Say you slip on um, the 10th question, you do 10 extra questions which aren't specifically related to the step and then you go back to question 11. So that by the time you get to question 30, you've still got 30 days of sobriety. And the thinking is if you've been sober for a month, um, you've got enough experience to start working with someone else to help them through the first three steps uh, themselves. Um, and, and really, 
working with someone else is the most powerful thing you can do to help yourself stay sober. I firmly believe I can't think about acting out if I'm actually thinking about how to help somebody else. And I wasn't good at helping other people. Although there's a bit of a rescuer in my nature, the rescuing for me was all about me feeling good. It wasn't really about the other person feeling good. And if I'm working with a sponsee, um, I'm in a headspace where I'm not uh, trying to, or I'm going to want to think about acting out myself. Um, so the next tool is literature and writing. So as I said, there's questions that are used to work all of the steps. Um, uh, How makes a lot of use of the big book and the AA 12 and 12, as well as um, style literature. And um, the way that this is done, um, people are asked to write out their answer to the question and then send it through to their sponsor so they can discuss it on the phone. Because it's believed that writing your answer down causes you to think about it in a different way to if you were just um, talking about it off the, off the cuff. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of addicts are very smart. And if they didn't have to write their answer down, uh, I, have a, I have a sponsor, for example, who's a barrister. He's obviously an expert at talking on his feet and sounding like he's very thoroughly prepared. And I, if I didn't get his answers in writing, I'd never know if, he was, if he'd actually written it out or if he was just talking to me over the phone. So if you write it down, it helps you clarify your thinking. And then if you read it out to your sponsor, it helps you think about what you've written and you get a chance to have a discussion about it. So that writing and then sharing and discussing it is a big part of the whole process. Um, then we've got uh, telephone calls. And this is one of the things that perhaps people don't like um, in, um, in how, because it sounds very um, strict. But um, people are required, particularly in the first 30 days, to do four calls a day, one for their sponsor, where they go through the answer to the previous day's question, and to make three outreach calls. Um, but the big thing about this, and speaking from my own experience, it helps to break the isolation and shame that we feel when we come into the program. Um, talking to other people forces us to realize that we're not alone in how we feel and what we've done. And, I think for the newcomer, that's very powerful. It can be hard to pick up the phone and it's really common for people to think uh, they're intruding when they make the phone calls, uh, that they're taking up someone else's time and they shouldn't do that. But in actual fact, receiving the phone call can be a wonderful way to stay sober yourself. You're, you're performing an act of service by listening to someone else and perhaps by giving them feedback and um, yeah, it, um, it's a powerful tool. And I, I personally believe the re reason we do three calls every day, um, other than the fact that it's, it's written on the packet and we just follow the instructions, is that if we're making calls on days when we feel good, it's a lot easier to pick up the phone on days when we're feeling bad because we've developed a habit. And really, re good recovery is about developing new habits. Um, we just have to do the, re the required things and do them again and do them again and do them again so that they're automatic. Um, and on the bad days, it's a lot harder then for our brain to revert into its old ways of thinking. Um, it gets easier to pick up the phone in order to stop and pray, um, whatever it might be. Um, some of just doing some exercise or something, but something to break that, um, that old pattern of addictive thinking. And I think the regular phone calls Obviously, we, we, we build up a little peer group of people we've come into recovery with or that we meet in the early stages. And we probably ring those friends more often. Um, and we, we start to feel like we're part of a community by doing that. We've got our friends at the meetings, or at least people we see every week at meetings, and there's a level of comfort in that. And then there's the people who we share all the gory details with on the phone that we can pour our hearts out to and feel safe in doing it. And that, that really is... Um, rejoining um, the community of the human race, I think. Um, yeah, for me, um, telephone calls actually helped me to start rebuilding my self-esteem quite early in recovery. So I remember 
summer in the first year, I got an outreach, I took an outreach call from a guy who shared some what I thought were really disturbing dreams with me. Sufficiently disturbing that I won't share the detail with you. Um, but I got off the phone feeling really icky and thinking, why, why did he choose me to talk to? Does he think I'm as uh, depraved as he is? And I outreached about it um, and got a real shock when uh, the person I was talking to said, the reason he probably called you is because you're a good listener and he felt safe to actually talk to you. And I, I hadn't been willing to give myself any positive kind of affirmation in, in, in that situation at all. I just thought he must think um, I'm as bad as he is, which is why he's telling me about it. And, and um, that was the first concrete moment I can remember starting to change the way I thought about myself. Yeah, that maybe I can be helpful to people um, just through being who I am. Um, another SLA how requirement is that we go to a minimum three meetings a week. And as I mentioned, um, there are sobriety requirements for sharing at a meeting. So 14 days for newcomers who haven't um, yet been stepped up and, and seven days for people who have finished uh, step three. And I think the attitude in, in how is that speaking is a privilege, not an entitlement. And it comes back to those early days uh, the, the, in the 90s in Sydney where um, people were just talking about acting out and they were talking about how bad they felt. They were sharing their, their trauma, their wounds, but they weren't sharing recovery. And um, I have to say that the, these uh, guidelines aren't necessarily followed particularly well at a how meeting any more than they might be at a non how meeting. But in theory, there should be no negative sharing or no emotional dumping in a, in a meeting. Um, if you've got something negative to talk about, you talk to your sponsor or you talk about it in an outreach call, you get feedback. Um, that same negative thing that you've outreached about, you might share it in a meeting, but you might talk about how you've used the tools to deal with that problem so that there's at least a positive spin on it. That's the idea. You talk about the solution and people listening hear about the solution so they can learn from that themselves. Um, yeah, and it, it's interesting. I've noticed in meetings recently and it's, it's uh, happening in how meetings, which is to show that um, having a set of guidelines doesn't mean they'll be followed necessarily. But um, I've heard people do shares that don't mention the steps, that don't mention the tools, and really they could be uh, in group therapy or some other kind of self-help program because there's nothing about SLA, there's nothing about the steps, there's nothing about outreach or whatever. It's just, uh, I'm really missing my kids since the divorce because I can't see them or um, my partner's really pissing me off because they did X, Y, Z. And there's no recovery in that. Um, and I have to say, I'm as guilty as anyone about wanting to get current. Um, and when I'm still in the pain, I may not think about saying that in a positive way. Um, but what I'm trying to train myself to do now, I've become conscious of this as an issue, is to always put my problem in the context of how do I deal with it? How can the, how can the steps and the tools help me to work through the problems that I've got? And um, yeah, so meetings, I think, are one of the most critical tools because just to bring, bring it back to my own story during the period when I didn't have a sponsor, other than my business coach, she wasn't really sponsoring me. She, she was giving me 12 step advice as part of our conversation. I never stopped going to meetings and that was really my lifeline. Um, they helped me hear sanity from other people. Um, and they helped me to realize that I wasn't really very sane, that I wasn't very healthy. Um, so yeah, they, they were my anchor during some very dark days. Uh, the next tool that's used by the How Concept is prayer and meditation. Obviously, that, those are tools of um, all 12 step programs. But in the How Concept, you're encouraged to use prayer and meditation from day one. Um, to build that relationship with a power greater than ourselves. And yeah, I, th I think this is obviously a sticking point for many people 
um, when they come into the program and they don't know um, how to, to have that relationship with a higher power. But I think um, there's a number of reasons why this is really powerful, whether you believe in what you're doing or not. Um, for me, prayer is a form of surrender. It's acknowledging my powerlessness and acknowledging that I don't have all the answers. And because I tend towards grandiosity, um, my default state is to think that I do have all the answers, or if I don't, I can work them out. So prayer helps me to stay humble and acknowledge that I don't have the answers and I shouldn't expect to. And um, I was going to say addicts tend to have very busy or messy minds, but maybe I should just speak for myself. Um, but I can ruminate a lot um, and my thoughts can go whizzing around my head so quickly that um, I'm not really sure what I'm thinking. I can get very confused. But Prayer and meditation is a way for me to start the day um, by slowing my mind down, giving it in a, a, a good space um, before I go out into the world. One interesting thing in the HOW program, there's no restrictions or instructions as to how you should or shouldn't pray or meditate. Uh, that's up to the individual to figure out. Uh, the, simple, the important thing is to actually uh, try and do so on a regular basis. Um, the next tool, uh, number six, is service, um, which the HAL program defines as freedom from the bondage of self, uh, giving back what we've been given. And I guess a good way to think of it is physical, practical, spiritual action that helps us to stay sober. Um, as I said before, when I'm uh, in a headspace where I'm helping someone else, I'm not going to be the headspace where I'm going to act out. And the more um, I get used to helping other people, the less attractive uh, acting out uh, seems to be. And it's funny, I, I didn't grow up uh, being the sort of person who likes to run around doing things for other people. I was selfish and I was lazy. And I remember uh, the first time I, I did the service of opening up a meeting for someone who the, a secretary who couldn't turn up on that occasion. I had I'd been given the keys and I turned up early and I got all the gear and set up the room and and I must have got there well before anyone else. It was very quiet and peaceful. It was in the crypt of a large church, um, and I had just the most wonderful feeling of uh, caring for and helping. The other people in that meeting. It was a really nurturing kind of feeling and I really hadn't experienced anything like that before except maybe sometimes in relationships but not I don't think in such a healthy way. It just really made me realize how amazing service can be if it's being done for the right reasons and I, I have to watch that I don't do service out of a feeling of obligation because then it stops being fun and it stops being spiritual. Uh, the, key, the key is to want to help other people. And I've learned that that most definitely helps me stay sober. So for me, service is putting someone or something uh, else before what I want. Um, I frequently don't want to pick up the phone when someone rings for an out outreach call. Um, sorry, my parrot's just trying to eat my iPad. Not very good. Um, I don't necessarily want to take calls from sponsors some of the time because I've had a hard day and I don't want to listen to someone else's problems. Um, but the reward is there for me if I choose to do it anyway, regardless of how I'm feeling. Um, because if I can help someone else, and sometimes it's just a case of helping by listening, I don't have to have answers. I just have to be there. Um, then I end up feeling better as a result of that. I get a sense of belonging in the SLA community. Um, and I, I really make and own my place in the community of recovery. Um, I get to actually participate in recovery rather than just putting in cameo appearances at meetings. I really think service is such an important thing. And to be honest, although it's there as a tool in the HOW program, uh, I personally don't think we have it enough because it's really, really uh, critical um, for a healthy fellowship for as many uh, people as possible to be putting in service. We, we, we all get better through helping each other. And I guess a key form of, of, of service is sponsorship, which is the last of the seven 
uh, our concept tools. Um, and this is one of the areas really, so most of the other tools I've talked about, other than sobriety requirements and meetings, the tools that they're just tools of uh, recovery, which we all use regardless of how we work our program. One of the neat things about the HAL program is that it gives very clear guidelines to sponsors. There's not a lot of them because they're principles rather than specific instructions, but there's two pages of um, information on how to be a sponsor because we ask people to do it fairly early in their recovery. Um, they only need, as I said, 30 days of sobriety to start sponsoring other people. And of course, at that point, you don't have all the answers. And I don't know about everyone else listening who's, um, who is a sponsor, but I certainly thought in the early days I was supposed to have all the answers and I was supposed to be able to solve my sponsor's problems. So one of the first benefits I got from sponsoring is a lot of personal growth because I realised I couldn't possibly have all the answers. And even if I did happen to to uh, as much by chance as anything else, know the right course of action or what turned out to be the right course of action. It didn't mean that my sponsor would want to follow it anyway. And as I said, when I was telling my story, I've learned I can't impose um, what I think is right on somebody else. I think a key role of a sponsor is to allow sponsees to make their own mistakes and, and to be prepared to support them. So I'm, I may well tell my sponsees that I think they're making a mistake and I'll tell them why, illustrating it from my own experience. Um, but I, I firmly believe it's their right to make that mistake if they think it's the correct thing for them to, to do. Um, and for me, that's where I've got a lot of growth. I have always been uncomfortable with conflict because of the upbringing in my family. If I was to tell mum I disagreed with her, it just wasn't worth the emotional drama that followed. So I would just bite my tongue and probably get passive aggressive or something like that. Um, and I've had to learn how to pick up responses. And a big part of that for me has been setting boundaries around phone calls. Because for those first 37 days, um, the phone calls have to be every day. And as I said, a lot of people ask me to sponsor them. So I, I normally have quite a few sponsees, which means um, people get time slots and they have to stick to those time slots. So I've had to get a lot better at setting boundaries with people up front. And then I've also had to deal with my own feelings of uh, discomfort when someone doesn't call because my brain wants to make it all about me, that the response is disrespecting me by not bothering to call and not bothering to text me and say that they're unable to make the appointment. Um, and instead, I, I've practiced learning to think, I wonder what's actually going on for the sponsee that they haven't called. Um, because it's, I know intellectually, if someone doesn't ring, it's highly, I know it's highly unlikely it's got anything to do with me at all. But emotionally, it's always felt like um, it's because I'm unimportant, they don't care enough to tell me uh, that they aren't ringing. So I've had to grow through that um, and learn to set boundaries, which has been really helpful. Um, so the sponsor's guide says things like share your experience, strength and hope, don't give advice, um, particularly if it's something that's got nothing to do with sex and love addiction. Um, and even if it has, I don't believe we can ever tell someone what to do. Um, we can just share uh, what's happened for us. Um, and yeah, people, people have to be allowed to make their own mistakes. I get horrified every time I hear someone, I'm, the worst thing I think I've heard in a meeting is someone say their sponsor told them to stop taking their antidepressants because they needed to feel their feelings. And you know, we're not doctors, we're not psychiatrists, we're not um, even therapists. <clears throat> and we're not supposed to be experts in those things. We're only supposed to, to um, help our sponsees work the um, steps and share our own personal experience of the program and doing that. Um, I've had to learn not to try and be a therapist to my sponsees and not to let them think of me as a therapist. The purpose of a phone call is simply to work through the um, question on the particular step that they're working on and to also help, sorry, my parents just decided to stand on the computer. There, this is Buddy who helped me achieve my emotional breakthrough and start to feel my feelings. 
he's an annoying little creature a lot of the time. But it's been a real education for me, having to learn how a parrot might think, having to put myself, because yelling at an animal that doesn't understand doesn't work. And so I've had to actually practice thinking what might be going on for him, um, which is not an easy exercise and it really forces me to think outside the box. Um, other sorts of things that are in the sponsor's guide would say things like she or struggle, don't allow yourself to be pedestalized, um, discuss the joys of service and giving to how, share your honesty, admit if you're having a problem, if you slip or act out, admit it, and you're supposed to um, both tell your own sponsor that you've had a slip and tell your sponsees that you've had a slip. And if you, and if the sponsees wish to, um, you help them find someone else to work with if they don't want to stick with you. It's actually really affirming, speaking of someone who went through a period where I had a lot of slips, it's actually quite rare for a sponsee, well, for me, in my experience, it was quite rare for a sponsee to want to walk away. They still want to keep working with you in the first instance, and in my case, even the second and third instance. But that really helped me to understand that I didn't have to be perfect to help other people. And in fact, my struggles, um, the things that I've been through, the challenges I've had are a big part of what makes me a good sponsor. Because I can tell people what didn't work. I've learned a lot of stuff the hard way. Um, and then the, the big negative I hear from people who don't like the HOW program is the, is the discipline of it. And interestingly, the sponsor's guide says, share your discipline. Um, and I think if I, if I step back from thinking just about the HOW program, um, it requires discipline to work the 12 steps any way uh, you want to talk about. You can, you can take what you like and leave the rest, but that doesn't mean you'll get a good quality of recovery. I think maybe in some, some fellowships like AA or NA, where you're cutting into some substance, um, maybe you don't have to work so hard, but I think for us where um, we're dealing with emotions and relationships and connection with other people, then um, we really have to work hard at this. We need to work um, the structured program on a daily basis. And if we don't, um, we are going to struggle. We need to have the tools at our hands that allow us to deal with the feelings that we used to act out to cover up. So I, I, I firmly believe, based on my own experience, that um, I really didn't understand why I acted out. And as I said, my feelings were deeply locked away. So. Um, where I would have acted out in the past, now I'm not, now I'm sober, stuff comes up that I have to deal with, I have to sit with the feelings, I have to name them and just wait for them to pass. And if I don't have the tools of the program, I'm going to act out again, because I don't know how to deal with those feelings if they come up. And they may not come up for a while, I might, I might leave the program and I might get six months or a year or two. But something's going to happen sooner or later that triggers that childhood trauma and I'm going to fall back in the old ways of acting if I haven't kept practicing the program the whole time. So um, I think uh, that discipline is a really critical part of the program. We don't have to be perfect. And in fact, obviously, we can't be perfect. But um, nevertheless, discipline and structure are what help us get um, not just sobriety, but a good quality of life from this world Okay, so I'm just trying to find my bullet points to see. I think I've covered everything on the program except now the, 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 the Q&A. Um, I'm just going to link it back before we get to the questions. Um, I was just talking about structure and discipline. One of the highlights of service for me um, in the fellowship was uh, I've helped to run a number of conventions in Sydney and in 2018 we brought out a couple from America and the guy um, has spent a lifetime as a psychologist treating addiction. He studied with um, Pia Malady. Um, he has a PhD in psychology. He's got 30 years sobriety in SLA. And his wife came out as well. They've been together for well, 20 years now. I think it was 18 at the time of the convention. And they did a workshop on how they use the tools in their relationship. And it was a um, huge success in the sense that we all got so much from those talks. And I've just been listening to the tapes again 
you can find them on the um, Slow Australia website on the news and events page down the bottom. And in the Q&A after Randy's talk, he um, got asked a question, someone in um, Queensland, I think, about how to get sober with no one else at the meeting, and, uh, get up more than a week or two. And he got thrown by this question initially. And then he said, he eventually came to the conclusion that it's really easy for us to bond over our, um, our shame, bond over our acting out and to talk about our relapses um, and to feel part of a group because of that. But he said, if we're gonna get sober, we have, to, we have to really commit to getting sober and to focusing on that as a solution. And he really talked about, I think, why the how program came into being. It's a focus on the solution, not the problem. And having the discipline and structure to keep focus on the solution, to keep working this in a structured way. Um, so I just thought that I listened to that a couple of nights ago. Um, I just thought that was a neat symmetry with the way that the HAR program actually came into being in Sydney. We need that discipline and structure, sex and love addicts. It may not be through the HAR program, but we do need discipline and structure to, to make recovery work for us. And we do need to focus on the solution. So I'll wind up there and um, take some questions, I guess. Thank you so much, Shane. I would like everyone to join me in a round of applause. Thank you. Um, please feel free to send your questions through to me in the chat. And we'll begin. Uh, so the first question, Shane, um, is from a member. My toxic shame and self-loathing lie behind my addiction. I find how very harsh and judgmental. I request your views on how how supports me in developing self-compassion, self-acceptance and self-love. Thank you. Okay. Um, I find it difficult to put myself into that headspace because I'm not sure why how would be judgmental. I think we're, we're all coming from the same place. Um, the, the, the challenge in how obviously is to get sober so you can share and if you're struggling to get sober I can imagine it's easy to feel judged and I know when I was slipping regularly I didn't want to share that with people who, are, who knew me in meetings um, but I think the best way to develop self-compassion and self-respect is through working the program and um, yeah I, I've seen people leave because they've been around for a long time in sobriety and had a slip and feel terrible and, and imagine they're going to be judged and the rest of us are just feeling terrible that they're not coming to meetings and we're worried about them. I really don't think um, there's a lot of judgment there except in our own minds. And that the HOW program, as I said, it, it focuses on the solution, not the problem. There's no need to talk about the problems in meetings. Um, you can start to heal by going and listening to the solution and uh, trying to find a sponsor who will really support you. Um, you know, if, if your current sponsor doesn't work, find someone else, listen to people at meetings and pick someone who you relate to um, and they should be able to support you on your journey through starting to recover. Thank you. Um, we've got a few questions here asking about the 30 questions. Um, and if there is a pamphlet or a manual, would you like to address that? Yeah, um, I was invited to provide all the materials today. And initially I said I was going to, and then I thought, no, because one of the things with the 30 questions, um, they're structured so you do a question a day, and I'm reluctant to ever give sponsees a copy of those questions because some people will race through them. I, I dole them out one at a time. Um, so that each day there's some work to do because I think that that repetition of the tasks every day is a big part of getting into the habit of thinking about recovery. So um, those questions reside in a document called the Sponsors Guide. Uh, you get that when you finish the 30 questions. Uh, what I didn't mention is a little private ceremony that's held between the sponsor and the sponsee at the end of step three. And then there's a stepping up within the meeting, which is simply the sponsor and the sponsee each speaking for two minutes each about the process that they've just been through and obviously a round of applause um, to acknowledge that someone's reached that point. Um, 
but yeah, the sponsor is the person who had that document. Um, and the, there's nothing special about the questions. It's more the fact that you're doing one a day every day for a month. The questions don't have right or wrong answers. They're just designed to get you to think about different parts of the recovery text that's being looked at and to enable a good discussion with the sponsor so, so that you learn through that process. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from a newcomer here. Does the how program set your bottom lines or do I as or does each individual um, set their own bottom lines? Each individual sets their own bottom lines very definitely. There's a set of questions that are designed to help you do that. Uh, where it can get complicated I suspect is that some sponsors probably tell their sponsees you should do this. And I've started to move in that direction a little bit. I never force people to have bottom lines, but I do encourage the men I'm sponsoring to have complete celibacy for that month. Because some will say, for example, porn and masturbation isn't a problem for me. I have affairs and I need to have bottom lines around affairs. And my, I, my encouragement is to um, have complete celibacy for that month, just to see whether um, there are any challenges in that. Um, all the bottom lines can be reviewed at the end of that first month. But at the end of the day, it's always the sponsor's decision what their bottom lines are. Thank you. Um, do you have any pamphlets or pieces of literature that have helped you the most in your recovery? Ah, what an interesting question. Um, different things at different times. Um, I'm just trying to think the best, funnily enough for me, I, I had a real problem with giving my power away to women that I was attracted to, and I didn't understand that for the longest time. And the literature that helped me the most is something that I suspect most people never read, and it's in the SLA handbook. There's a chapter on starting a new meeting, I think it's called, start, no, it's called Starting an SLAA Group, and it talks in there there's a section about um, special interest meetings. And it says that nowhere in SLA has, um, at the point when they wrote the, the book, had a men's meeting or a specific women's meeting been set up or an LGBTQI meeting either. And it talks about how we, we practice recovery through being in meetings with people we would have been attracted to in the real world. And we have a safe environment in which to learn to deal with those types of people. Um, to get to know them as real people and not just see them as types that would have um, uh, triggered us or encouraged us to act out in the real world. And that uh, really opened my mind up and helped me enormously. And I, I suspect most people never read that chapter because most people aren't going to start, start a new meeting by themselves. So I'd encourage you to flick through that and see what's in there. Some of it won't be relevant, but some of it could be very helpful. Thank you. Um, there's a question here. I'm currently at step four, but I feel a bit lost as to what to do. Should I just follow my sponsor's guidance? Do you have any advice? Uh, step four is really tricky. And I think it's, it's the most challenging part of the HOW program because you go from answering a question every day and having this real sense of momentum and accomplishment that you've had build up. And then suddenly in step four, you're kind of working at your own speed and that's a very difficult adjustment. Um, I think the most practical advice, and I, I, without knowing what the sponsor's advice is, it's difficult to know what to say, but I think it's really helpful to book a time for your first step and goal to work towards, even if that date has to get shifted, because I've found procrastination is the biggest problem of step four. And what I found worked for me, at the time I did step four, my wife and I were separated and I would go around to her flat and I would sit there at the dining table and she'd know I was there to do that. She'd leave me alone, but I couldn't get on my phone. I couldn't get on the computer. I couldn't make phone calls. I had to sit there and just work for half an hour or however long I stayed. And that worked for me to kind of force myself to make progress. Um, each person will have their own solution to that, but my advice, just try and chip away at even five or 10 minutes every day. Uh, and don't feel it has to be perfect. It won't be and you'll pick up more stuff next time you do step four or um, you can deal with stuff you've missed in step 10 if it comes up. Thank you. Um, the next question, I found step six the most challenging emotionally as defects of character are removed. 
What was your step six like spiritually and emotionally? Um, that's a really interesting one. I, I think, I'm, as I said, I wasn't really sober when I was doing the steps the first time around. And I don't think I had the full spiritual experience of doing it. But um, what I will say is that while our higher powers can take away the urge to act out, they never take away our character defects completely. So for me, they're an ongoing thing that I have to keep working on. And funny enough, I tend to use the combination of steps 10 and 11 to deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So if I have a conscious focus in the morning on a character defect that I'm having a problem with, say perfectionism, I, I pray for help with that in the morning. And then when I do my reflections at the end of the day, I ask myself if my perfectionism came up at all. And I think about how it played out. And I ask myself, what could I have done better? And gradually over time, I change because I start to catch myself in situations where the character defect would play out. And I suddenly realize I have a choice and I can do it differently. So I, I kind of think if our character defects were all removed as we did six and seven, we'd have no personality left. I'm sure our character defects are what makes us who we are. So I, I think it's a lifelong struggle to, to deal with some of those, to be honest. Um, we've got a couple of questions around anorexia. Um, anorexics have a hard time making calls. This is part of the disease. Um, have you seen a way for anorexic people to success, successfully work the how method? Uh, that is a tricky one. Um, I don't have a lot of personal experience working with sponsees who are anorexic. I mean, I, I think a lot of us have uh, anorexia to some extent, but I'm assuming uh, the question is talking about whether this is the major characteristic of the disease. And it is very difficult. And I, I think the key is to find people in the fellowship you feel safe talking to. Um, having said that, um, there are anorexia specific meetings in Sydney, and I'm sure they probably exist in Melbourne. And I'm even more sure they're probably all on Zoom now because that's a lot easier for someone who's feeling anorexic. I, I can say that the UK have been rewriting the How Concept documents. And there's a lot more focus on anorexia in those documents than the original ones. So it may be, um, I haven't seen them, I saw a draft years ago, so I've kind of forgotten what the changes look like, but it may be that the new documents will have some tools that help. But I think this is why bottom lines aren't absolute in SLA. Um, that people with anorexia, top lines are probably much more important. Um, and it may be that you can't make four calls a day. Um, I have sponsors who don't follow all the requirements of the HAL program because they just can't. And um, they may be requirements, but if you can't do them, you can't do them, and you just really have to do the best you can. But sorry, I don't have an absolute answer to that question. No, thank you. Um, I'm not sure we're going to get through all of the questions because we've got to, got to wrap it up, but I'll maybe take one more question. Um, I really appreciate your comments on sponsoring, setting boundaries and not giving advice, therapy. Um, I'm currently on step 10. What is your step 10 and 11 practice? Um, that's a really good question. I think I alluded, alluded to it with the um, uh, character defects question before. I, I actually write out in the morning um, as part of my and I, I start to get confused now about what's 10 and what's 11, but I, I actually write out the things I'm struggling with uh, before I pray. And then they, um, I go through my daily, uh, I've got a couple of daily readers. I've got um, one of the first copies of the new SLA uh, daily reader, which is coming out as a paperback shortly, if we can actually get deliveries from the States because of COVID, but it's fantastic. Um, I use that in the morning, maybe a different book as well. Um, there's a, a couple of prayers I read, um, then, then I go through the um, character defects I'm struggling with and include them in my prayer. Um, I meditate, uh, the length of time varies depending on how busy I am. I'm not a great meditator, I have to admit. Then in the evening, I do it somewhat informally now, but I reflect on the day and it's particularly going back to those character defects that I'm concerned about and just asking, um, 
what came up uh, that I didn't do well and how could I improve on it? What could, or what could I, sometimes I don't ask how could I do it better, but just how could I do it differently? If I've had some kind of interaction in the day that's been a real mess, I just ask myself, well, how did I feel when that was going on? Because often these things turn bad because I've been triggered. And so when I'm triggered, I'm not thinking clearly. So in the evening, when I reflect on it, I can have a bit more self-awareness and ask myself, um, what could I have done differently? And then gradually that pool of knowledge of what I could do differently starts to accumulate into something that I trust and believe and can act on in the future. Wonderful, thank you. Um...